Good morning and welcome to Mount Carmel on this 11th Sunday of Pentecost. The text for next week's sermon is Romans 6. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Dear God, we come before you with grateful hearts for the care and provision of this past week. We realize how blessed we are to live where we are free to worship you. Please help us to use the blessings you have bestowed upon each of us to become a blessing to others. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to enjoy this beautiful weather of summer and the bountiful crops it produces. We pray for continued courage, strength, wisdom, and hope in the week ahead. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Our opening hymn is found on page 427, Where Cross the Crowded Ways of Life. Please stand to sing and remain standing for the Apostles' Creed.
the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may sit down. Good to see you all. Let's pray together. Most holy God, creator of the universe, we come humbly before you this morning, lifting to you our praise and thanksgiving. We thank you that you have given us an enduring hope one which cannot disappoint us or mislead us. We thank you that through our faith in you and in your son Jesus, you enter into every believing heart and make new lives that the darkness of this world has torn apart. We pray today that those believers who are asleep in faith may awake and know your salvation is nearer now than when they first believed. Help us all to lay aside the works of darkness and to put on the armor of light that you give those who actively seek you day by day. Grant that their faith and ours may be fully alive. We pray today, O oh Lord, for those who have lost hope or those who have never had it. Grant to us and to those we lift to you in our hearts a new and lasting vision of what you have done. What you're going to do and what you will do to save and redeem your people and creation itself. Grant, O oh God, that we all might see and believe and discover our purpose and the purpose of all that is and all that is yet to be. We lift before you, O oh Lord, those persons and those people and those places named in our prayer concerns. There are many, Lord. They are grieving the loss of a loved one or perhaps facing the loss of their independence. They could be sick And sickness wrecks the quality of their lives. Hope sometimes slowly and sometimes rapidly escapes their vision for the future. They're separated from their families and perhaps their houses. They struggle with addictions that destroy relationships, jobs, and their own rational senses. We ask all of this of you, O oh God, knowing that you are our hope and our salvation, a very present help in times of trouble, and the one whose purpose is to grant new and abundant life to us and our world. We pray, O oh Lord, in the name of Jesus, who gave his life for us. Amen. When we come and think of the offering, we frequently think about what we give, what we do. And I kind of highlight that every, every week. Today I want to focus on the bread and the juice because it's about what Jesus did, the giving that he gave. And I know there are folks who think because I, uh, I highlight 
what you do in the world with the gifts you give us, that it's all about money. It's not about money. It's not about money. It's about people. It's about people lost, people hurting, people hungry, people on the streets, people without health care. And it's about those of us who have all those things taken care of. And what God calls us to do. So when we dedicate our offering, it's not simply the money that comes here. It's the work you do. It's the work that's done through them and the people who are impacted that we not only give you thanks for, but we lift to God in praise and thanksgiving for what God will do in their lives. Let's receive the morning offering. for the, all the things, all the grace, all the hope you have given to us. And we take this portion of our wealth along with our commitment of our minds and bodies and give them to you for the building of your kingdom. Not our reputation, but your grace in a world that hurts. Use them and use us, Lord, that we might be effective in ministry in your name. We give you the praise and the glory. Amen.
This morning's responsive reading is from the Book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 18 through 21. Just as one person did it wrong and got us in all this trouble with sin and death, another person did it right and got us out of it. But more than just getting us out of trouble, he got us into life. One man said no to God and put many people in the wrong. One man said yes to God and put many in the right. All that passing laws against sin did was produce more lawbreakers. But sin didn't and doesn't have a chance in competition with the aggressive forgiveness we call grace. When it's sin versus grace, grace wins hands down. All sin can do is threaten us with death, and that's the end of us. Grace because God is invites us into life, a life that goes on and on and on, world without end. This ends this morning's reading. Let's pray together. Lord, now pour your spirit upon us. Help us to open our ears and our hearts and our minds that we can clearly hear your word. Help us to digest it and make it ours. And we pray for the preacher, Lord, that you put your words in his mind and mouth and that all we hear is your word and not mine. In Christ's name, amen. Clothes are interesting. Just take a look around. In the early chapters of Genesis, clothes cover the shame of Adam and Eve's nakedness. Since then, their purpose has evolved to something entirely different. Today, clothing has become a statement. Well, clothes make many statements. If we're serious about it, clothes tell us the story of status, wealth, and in many cases, occupation. Clothes cover our bodies, hide our scars, and assist us in making good impressions. And we make judgments about people who wear specific clothes. Depending on the uniform they wear, we might discover their occupation, their nationality, their heritage, or status. Think of doctors, nurses, construction workers, police officers, a member of the armed forces, judges, or unhoused people. Our skin color, food preferences, and lifestyle all help identify us. But clothes can't cover up the truth about us. No matter how many sizes, lower, smaller, than you wear, no matter how much you try to get into those clothes, just a simple piece of understanding. It ain't gonna work. So we sometimes wear clothes that are too big to hide us. But the basic truth is, we're all basically the same. Even if our bodies have different structures, appearances, and specific chemistries. And biblically, we have a common ancestor, Adam and Eve. And according to genealogical studies, most of us came from common ancestry originating many, many years ago in, you want to guess where? Anybody want to guess? Anybody do any genealogical research? What? Africa. Africa. Nigeria, some place in Nigeria. Now, I hate to say this, 
to that. But I did find out that's true of most of you as well. I discovered when I did my genealogical uh, study uh, that I'm part Neanderthal. <laughs> Fran could have told you that. <laughs> I had to get the study to prove it. Oh well. So perhaps the Garden of Eden really isn't in the Middle East, but in Eastern Africa. I'm sorry, yes, Eastern Africa. Who knows? At any rate, Paul expresses the human dilemma of rebelling against God as plaguing humanity since Adam's fall. He reminds us that because of Adam and Eve's behavior and sense of self-importance, sin entered creation and has infected every human since. Until their focus on themselves, on their desires, there was no sin. And as we heard from the past several weeks, the issue is not the sins we commit. They tend to be outcomes of the greater evil of our rebellion against God's will for us. Sin with a capital S. We just want to have it our way. Regardless of age, we never lose that child within us that calls for our self-actualization. We've preferred our will and our preferences to God's will. That, friend, is the real issue that Paul is addressing here in this chapter in Romans. Do our sins, small s, make a difference? You bet they do. Do those actions frequently destroy relationships? Yup. Do they serve God? Probably not. But the issue that drives them might be more significant because it concerns our eternal existence. Serving ourselves and putting our way above God's will for us has eternal results for our lives and institutions. It harms our relationships with God, each other, our families, our communities, our schools, and religious institutions. My hunch is that most of you would agree with that. But I'm guessing that if we begin to dissect our agreement, we'll have different views about why things are so bad. For instance, if we talk about how bad our public schools are, the more conservative folks would say it's because of those liberal socialists who have no morals and want to indoctrinate our children and allow just about everything. On the other hand, the more liberal faction would blame, note the word, blame those book-burning fascists who want to deny our rights so that we can restrict all students from accessing history. And we know the culture that is in power at the time dominates the decisions. But this sermon, though it has political relevancy, is really about the great divide in humanity driven by the blame game, which ultimately comes from a self-focused, self-serving population. One of the tragedies of our day is that many Christian churches in Western cultures are dying. Why is that? According to research by former pastor turned church consultant, Tom Rayner, in an article published in Church Leaders in September of 2021, there are at least six primary reasons. One, dying churches refuse to admit they are sick, very sick. Thomas worked with churches whose attendance has declined by over 80%. They have no gospel witness in the community. They have not seen a person come to Christ in two decades, but they say they're fine. They say, nothing wrong with us. Or so two, they're still waiting on the magic bullet pastor. 
They reasoned that if only we could find or the bishop provide the right pastor, we would be fine. But they bring in the pastor after pastor. Each leaves after a short-term stint, frustrated by the congregation because it was so entrenched in its ways. So the church asked for or starts to search again for the magic bullet pastor. Three, they fail to accept responsibility. Tom says, I recently met with the remaining members of a dying church. Their plight was the community's fault. Those people should be coming to their church. It was the previous five pastors' fault, or it was the fault of the culture. We would be fine if everything returned to the Bible Belt mentality of decades earlier. Reason number four, they're not willing to change at all. A friend asked Tom to meet with the remaining members of a dying church. These members were giddy when, with excitement, Tom says. They viewed me as the great hope for their congregation. But my blunt assessment was not pleasing to them, especially when I talked about change. Finally, one member asked if they would have to look at the words of a hymn on a screen instead of a hymnal. If they made changes, would that have to happen? Tom says, I stood in stunned silence and soon walked away from the church that would close its doors six months later. Their solutions, this is number five, their solutions are all inwardly focused. They don't want to talk about reaching the ethnically changing communities if they live or worship in one. They want to know how they can make church more comfortable and palatable for the remnant of their members. And six, why dying churches? They desire to return to 1985. Well, well, well maybe 1972. Well, could, 1965 or 1959. Those were the good old days. If we could just go do church like we did then, everything would be fine. Now the tragedy is that these churches are increasing in number. Culture indeed has little patience with a me-focused congregation, much less so than it did, say, 15 years ago. Is there hope for these churches? Will these dying congregations indeed die? Tom reports he has seen God interview a few times in such situations. But in every case, the church has turned its face to him and forsaken their own preferences, desires, and human-centered traditions. Now, if you, as I do, read many articles on this subject, you, you'll see that churches are closing because of original sin. Rather than seeking God's direction, they prefer their wills to his. That's what we call original sin. The insider-focused church which caters to those already there, though their numbers are fewer, may make everyone happy. Still, it's also a great way to kill a church. They will only survive if new people keep showing up. One researcher states, once the church forgets this, you're on the way to decline. That means you're going to have to make money, take money and energy away from ministries for insiders and put them toward reaching those outside the church. He goes on, the church more co is more concerned with meeting preferences than gaining new people. That church is in trouble. When they refuse to change their style of worship, their worship music, even though the younger generation didn't enjoy it, when they ignore technology and social media 
And when they fight against the change every step of the way, they decide to change and be more responsive to others when it's too late. In effect, the train has left the station. And when we are confronted with our sin, we frequently rely on another human trait, blame. Blame goes hand in hand with pride. We blame others because we don't want to take responsibility for ourselves. The devil made me do it may be a great line for a comedy routine, but it's a terrible excuse for us to use. I recall suggesting to my, my father when I was doing something wrong as I was growing up, and I can't remember what it was, it was probably several things, and his response would always be the same. I would say, uh, I would say uh, he'd ask me why I did something. And I would say when he questioned me, I, I had to do it. His reply was always the same. Did somebody force you? Did they hold a gun to your head? How did they make you do it? And I had and still have no answer. So that question, because to use an excuse like that means I have no control. The fact is, I could have said no. It would probably cost me something that I desired and isn't that the dilemma for each of us? We filter our choices and values not through the lens of God's will, but to make us comfortable with the beliefs and values we've grown up with and valued all our lives, even if, we're contrary, if they're contrary to God's will. Writing in Religion News Service, Jennifer R. Farmer, while reporting a class action lawsuit against the African Methodist Episcopal Church for the loss of more than $90 million in retirement pension funds, addressed the issue. Why is our leadership not performing to the standards we should expect? She shared, she shared five reasons, but one in particular stuck out to me. In her book, First and Only, Why Black Women Say, What Black Women Say, about thriving in work and, and in life. She notes, we never, go so, we never get so established in our lives or careers where we don't have to choose. No matter how much good we've done, how many people we've helped, or how many accolades, we have to rack up. The potential to ruin our legacy with a poor decision is always there. Anyone can fail if they stop examining decisions with this in mind. It reminds me of Lamentations 3, 39 to 41. Why then does any living person complain? The writer asked. Why should anyone complain about their sins? We must search and examine our ways. We must return to the Lord. We should lift up our hearts and hands to God in heaven. Well, I don't mean that we should spend our lives looking inward. I do suggest that soul searching about our beliefs, values, and behaviors is critical to serving God and doing God's will. And so here we are. Assembled here, where in a few minutes we'll celebrate the great sacrificial meal that Jesus shared with us, his most trusted friends, on the very night in which he spared his life, he, which he prayed to God to spare his life, but understood that like you and I, to fulfill his faithful role, the role for which he was sent to earth, he would have to put God's will first above all else in his life, no matter the cost. And that, friends, is what we say when we recite Wesley's covenant prayer. You know, we do it the first Sunday of every year. I'm no longer my own, but thine, we pray. 
Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for thee or laid aside for thee. Exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. Writing about this prayer, Pastor Philip McClarty says, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we do well to pray with Wesley and be reminded that we're not free to follow the dictates of our own sinful nature. We're free to surrender to the will of God and to submit ourselves to the authority of Jesus Christ. Now, let me just put a parenthetical here. In my 50 plus years of ministry, I've used that prayer a lot on the first Sunday of the year. And only once did I have a parishioner say to me, Pastor, I can't pray that prayer. Because if I did, I know in my heart I couldn't keep it. Keeping it is how we serve God. By putting seeking God and his righteousness first and accepting God's abundant life. Just as we gather here and celebrate an act of sacrifice that we can have different lives and we can have different hope. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, you have set our fears free to go in peace as you have promised. For these eyes of ours have seen the Savior, whom you have prepared for all the world to see. Blessing and honor and glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
wheels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace.